1 John chapter 5. I told you last week I didn't have a name for my message. Um, and uh, I said, you know, perhaps I'll think of one before I post it. And I didn't. And uh, Brother Holt said he was, uh, he was listening to my message. And there was something I said. He said, uh, that would be a good title for it. Uh, but then before he talked to me, he forgot what the title was. So it still it didn't end up with a title. Uh, this message we will call No Title, Volume 2. No Title, Volume 2. Um, let's just read a few verses here, and then we'll get into the message. Uh, John, 1 John chapter 5, and uh, we'll read verse 10. Starting in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not in God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he, hath, he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've allowed us to be here today. We thank you for this season that we're in. We thank you for the, the, the joy that is in people's hearts as we uh, look to... Uh, look to uh, your son who you sent and you gave and who died and who rose again. And uh, as the scripture says here, if we believe these things, not just to uh, know that they happen, but we believe if we trust in these things, if we are dependent upon these things that you have showed us in your word, that we have eternal life. And that is the true meaning. That is the true message of this season. We just ask that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would enable us to uh, a share from the word of God, and that we might have understanding, and that we might look deeper into these things at time. We just, uh, at this time, we ask that you would bless the preaching. Uh, uh, forgive the messenger, Lord, and just enable him. Uh, we ask that you would save any that was lost. We ask that you would give us that are saved, a, a, a stronger belief, a stronger faith, a, a stronger assurance, because we know that we are trusting in him and not ourselves, and not our church, and not our baptism, and not our, our works, not anything but Jesus Christ. And we thank you for these truths. We just ask that if someone um, hears this message and is not saved, uh, the, the scripture says very uh, plainly, they have not life. The life is not in them. Uh, and, and they will die in their sins and go to hell without these truths that, that, that we trust in. So we just ask that you would give them the faith to believe in your son at this time. Uh, we just turn all these things over to you and we ask your blessings upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John talks about how he wrote, um, he wrote, this epistle that we might know, that we might have assurance. And we talked at the very beginning about all the tests that he gives us uh, in this epistle, in this letter, um, that um, we would have the assurance. He would tell us how to be saved, and if we are, and that we would know that we were saved because of our faith and because of our adherence to the things that he's talked about. Uh, the, 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 the great uh, the theme that just seems to come up constantly is that we, we love God, we love his commandments, and we love his children. And those are uh, very good tests of our, our salvation. Uh, you know, if we love God, we love his son, we love Jesus, because they are one and the same. Uh, if we love them, we, we love his commandments. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will follow the things that I have told you to do. I started to say, asked you to do. Uh, Jesus never asked us to do anything. He tells us what to do. 
He's not, we are not in the position for him to ask us to do everything, well, anything. His commandments are his commandments. They are commands. They are things that we follow that he would be glorified. But here's the thing. We benefit from the things he tells us to do. And that's another aspect of us trusting him. That we say, okay, if God wants us to do this, this is not only for his glory, this is for my good. And we follow him and we keep those commandments. He says very simply, he makes it simple, but we make it hard. He that believeth on the Son of God, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He talked uh, you might remember we, we spoke about the witnesses that were there, that, that Christ was who he, he said he was earlier in the, this chapter. In verse uh, 17, it says, The witnesses that are in heaven is the Father and the Word, which is Jesus and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. He talks about the witnesses that are in the earth. He talks about the, the Spirit and the Spirit of God and the water, which is the Word of God, and the blood, which was shed for us. And these three agree in one. They, they, they validate our salvation. And it simply says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. In other words, we exemplify. We exemplify Christ in us. Um, I know I've said it many times, and you may, may have said it. You, you at least probably knew it. Uh, if you didn't say it before I ever came here, before you ever heard me speak, before you even knew that, that uh, Keith Duncan existed, you, you knew this fact that there were certain people that you knew were Christians before they ever professed to you their faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christ in us testifies to the world. Um, some people just don't like us. And you say, well, why don't they like me? Because the, the Spirit of Christ inside of you testifies that you are of Christ and they are not of Christ. And if you ask them, they really couldn't explain why they didn't like you, why they treated you the way that they, they, they did. Then there are some that profess to know Christ, but their witness says they are not. Every once in a while, I'll think of uh, this gentleman. I don't even know his name. I don't even know. I guess he probably gave us his name when, when uh, we, we first met him. We went to the Hebrew Union College. Anybody know what Hebrew Union College is? Yeah. It is a college down in, in Clifton, Ohio, there in, in the Cincinnati area, uh, the Clifton area of Cincinnati. And uh, it is a, a Hebrew school, basically. It is a college, and they have a lot of artifacts. Well, when I was in Bible college, uh, we had a, a, a man that went to Winton Place. He attended Winton Place, and uh, he... Uh, did some teaching there, I believe. He had some involvement with the school. In any event, he got us. As a matter of fact, I, I was able to tour uh, the Hebrew Union College twice in my life. Once in high school because I was in the Latin class. Uh, you didn't know I was a Latin scholar, did you? you know, we sang that song, uh, Adeste Fidelis, earlier. Or, or I'm sorry, Oh Come All Ye Faithful, which is in Latin, Adeste Fidelis. In our, in our different, at, at Christmas time, the different language classes had to sing a Christmas carol, and we had some sort of program where we stood up and we sang the Christmas carol in our language. Perhaps the French class sang uh, the first Noel, you know, because that had the French origins, and the German class maybe sang a Stille Nacht. You all know Stille Nacht? Silent Night. And I took German too, by the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bad in three different languages. I'm bad in German and, and Latin and in English. And uh, so our, our, our um, class sang, O come all ye faithful, Adeste Fidelis, which is the Latin equivalent to, O come all ye faithful. Um, and we had the words there, but uh, believe it or not, I was not the best Latin student in the world. Uh, the only reason I took Latin is because our English teacher taught it, and she told us uh, 
that anyone who took Latin, she never failed anyone in Latin because um, she loved teaching Latin so much that she never failed anyone. Well, I misunderstood. I thought she meant that she gave everyone an A. That was not the, not the, the case. She just didn't give anyone an F. So I took Latin, uh, didn't apply it uh, too well. As a matter of fact, uh, it was opposite the class I really wanted to take, which was uh, guitar. And uh, uh, my counselor said, well, you know you would benefit more from Latin than you would guitar. Well, here I am pastoring a church and uh, we could probably use a guitar player here, and uh, uh, I can't play the guitar, and I can't speak Latin either. But anyway, we sang Adeste Fideles, and the, my version of Adeste Fideles was Adeste Fideles, Adeste Fideles, Adeste, Adeste Fideles. And I was hoping the other kids would, you know, drown me out so uh, you couldn't hear me. But in any event, um, what I was getting at, we went to, we went to the Hebrew Union College. And then uh, with uh, Brother Head got us in there. Or well, he didn't get us in. Another man got us in there. But we went in there. And uh, this man spoke to us. And it became obvious from the things he said during the tour, he didn't just speak, he led us around to, that he was a Christian. He was a Christian there at the, the Hebrew Union College. By the way, I, I made a terrible faux pas that day uh, while I'm digressing from my message. Um, we had to bring in our own lunch. And for some reason, I told you about this, didn't I, brother, brother, Brotherhood? Had to bring in our own lunch. And uh, I stopped off at the Shell Station to get me a Lunchable when we went in. And normally this is not something I ate, but for some reason, uh, maybe I was led by the Spirit of God, but I chose the Ham Lunchable. And I took the Ham Lunchable into the, the Hebrew Union and didn't even think about it until we sat down at lunch. And I thought, oh no, I'm eating ham here at the Hebrew school. Uh, but from what I understand, they don't care if you eat ham as long as they don't eat ham and they don't touch it or anything else. They, uh, um, so we get in there, but it was obvious this man was um, a Christian by the things that he said. And I always remember Brother Head saying, uh, this was, you know, a couple hours maybe into the, an hour or so into the, into the, the tour. He said, so I take it you're a professed Christian. And this man says, I am a Christian professed and otherwise. In other words, a lot of people profess to be a Christian, but he was not only a Christian in the way he spoke or, spoke or his profession, but he was a Christian on the inside. Amen. And that's what John is saying. When he talks about believing on the Son of God, he is talking about not just professing, not just believing that the Son of God exists. And I believe we quoted James last week when he said, you believe there is one God? You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. It's not just believing that Christ exists, not even just believing that Christ is the Son of God. It's believing on Him. It's trusting in Him. Uh, to give you an example, I know that there is a bridge. If you go down 75 and you get down, uh, go down through uh, Covington, I guess it is, there is a bridge, 75, 71, that leads over the Ohio River. Now, I know that bridge exists. I know in my head that bridge exists. I believe in that bridge. I know it's there. I've seen it. But just standing here telling you that that bridge exists, I'm not believing in that bridge. The only time I'm really believing in that bridge is when I am on that bridge. And I'm trusting that bridge to hold me up and get me across the river. So it's not just enough that you know that Jesus exists. It's not just enough that you know that Christ is the Son of God. 
You have to be trusting in him. You have to be relying on him to know that he will get you across. That you know that he has paid for your sins. Amen. That is what John is talking about. Amen. And that is the difference between a professed Christian and a possessed Christian. He says if you believe in him, you have life. If you don't believe in him, you don't have life. These are the conditions of a Christian. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe in him, you're calling God a liar according to what the scripture says there. You're calling Jesus a liar. You're calling the word of God lies. So it's not just, well, some people believe, some people don't, to each his own. No. You're speaking to the Father and you're saying, you're a liar because I don't believe. When you say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You don't believe that when Jesus, when he says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You don't believe the Holy Spirit, as he has given us the word of God. That, those are serious accusations. How many of you here like being called a liar? None of us do. But disbelief and faith is calling God a liar. This is the record, he says, that God hath given to us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. Everything that those three witnesses that are in heaven, those three witnesses that are on earth, all those things they testify, testify to the fact that God has given us his Son. This is the record. That means there is a record there. We are denying the record when we deny Christ. And so John says, these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may, that you may, that ye may know that you have eternal life. That would be a good title, perhaps, that you may know that you have eternal life. How to know you have eternal life? It's because you're believing the report that God has given. You are believing the witness. And we have, uh, the, under those conditions, we have eternal life. And it's a good thing. It says we can know that we have eternal life. You know, not every denomination that calls themselves Christians know that they have eternal life. There are many out there that believe you can lose your salvation. They don't know that they have eternal life. You say, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. So you have eternal life. Yes, I have eternal life. So you can't lose that salvation. Well, no, you can lose that salvation. You can deny the faith. You can fall from grace. You can do this or you can do that. You can lose it yourself. John says you can know you have eternal life. I know I've told you this before years ago. A uh, woman I worked with up at the hospital in Ohio, that tells you how long ago it was. She was a primitive Baptist. Um, I think they met one Sunday a month. I've heard uh, that sometimes uh, their, their preachers uh, show up uh, they can, they, a lot of them have three pastors, and all three pastors may preach on that Sunday. It may be an all-day thing. It may be none of they show up, and none of them say, well, I don't have anything to say today. Uh, so, but they, they get together. Now, they are hard-shell hyper-Calvinists. They are people who have taken the doctrines of grace and taken it way past the biblical standard 
of these doctrines, these doctrines of elections and, and, and foreknowledge and all these things. And they, she said to me that they don't believe, that they, they don't teach that you can know that you are saved. That just because you have faith in Jesus Christ doesn't mean you're saved because you can have faith in him, but you're not one of the elect. You can be someone who has never heard the gospel, never followed him, never, never believed in him because you didn't even hear of Jesus and still go to heaven and still be saved and still be redeemed because you are the elect. And that's contrary to Scripture. And she said, you can go and, and fully believe everything in the Bible and trust in everything in the Bible and stand at the judgment and God will say, I never knew you, you were none of my elect, and cast you out. He said, she said, you cannot know until the judgment. And I quoted this verse. I quoted this verse. And I said that, that, that this verse here says, uh, I think I might have pulled it up, grabbed my Bible and pulled it up. He says, and, and read it to her, these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know. Who, who, who can know? Those that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you can know that ye have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That you would hear of him, that you would, you know, uh, Paul said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And he wrote this so they would know of the Son of God, know who the Son of God was, and they could believe, and they would know that they had eternal life. The Bible says that you can know you have eternal life. Her answer was, well, I don't like to argue about those things. And that was the end of the conversation. There is no argument, by the way. If you believe the Bible, and this is in the Bible, then you can know you have eternal life. Paul, or John here, as we have said, has given us different tests where we can examine ourselves. So that, are, that is the condition of Christianity, the condition of the Christian. Here is the confidence of the Christian. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. We can have confidence not only in our eternal life, because we believe in the Son of God and we can know that we have eternal life. And eternal life means life eternal. It means forever. So we have assurance of our salvation. We also see that we have confidence that God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers. Now, it says he hears us, we can, but we can bring our, our petitions to him that we have desired of him. Now, does that mean, and I'm asking you, you already know the answer to this, and, and uh, uh, it seems rather rudimentary, it, it, it seems rather uh, juvenile, that we can ask God anything and he will give us what we want. But yet many are, are preaching that. Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be open unto you. But they don't look into what the scripture is saying. Number one, that scripture is something that, that, that the, 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 the tense there from what I understand, I already told you I'm not a Latin scholar. I'm not a German scholar. I'm barely, I can barely speak English a, a lot of times. But the Hebrew, the, the, the tense, from what I understand, it, it is a continual thing. That we continue to ask these things. But God gives us those things. 
matter according to his will. And what is according to his will? Once again, it's the things that are for his glory and for our good. And the more you are in tune with the Holy Spirit, the less you walk after the flesh, the more you walk after the Spirit, you, the more you study His Word, the closer you walk with Him, the more you are in tune to what His will is. Probably a couple of months ago, there was this little survey on Facebook where you filled it out and had these questions about your spouse. And you would give the answer, you know, what's her favorite food? What does she like to do? What is, and uh, I filled it out and I posted it and uh, somebody asked, you know, uh, put on there, asked Brenda, was he accurate? And she said, yeah, he knows me pretty well. Why do I know her? Because I spend time with her and, I, and I, I, I ask her the things that she wants and I, try, and I look to things that, she, that, that are pleasing unto her. So I know her pretty well because I'm attuned to her. Now, if we are attuned to God, we know what God desires, what God likes, what God expects from us. What God is willing to give to us. And so when we come to him and we ask, we have confidence that he hears us. And we're, we're not asking for something that is, that is frivolous. And sometimes it's not even things that are frivolous. It's just not his will. But we can come to him in confidence. As it says in Hebrews, we can boldly go into the throne of grace. I won't tell you what it was, but one time, I think I was probably about 17 years old, maybe 16. There was something I wanted to do. And my dad told me no. Which was his favorite word, by the way. And my sister knew that I really wanted to do this thing. Again, she said, well, aren't you upset? And I said, no, he was just looking out for my own good. I still wanted to do it, but I knew the reason he said no. So although I had my desire, I also trusted my dad. When we trust our Father, we have confidence that we can come to Him. And even if I ask something amiss, I can have confidence that He'll say no. It gets harder when you get grandbabies to say no. You just want to make them happy, and it's not always good for them. So that's our confidence. But we, we also have some concerns as Christians. If, if any man, it says in verse 16, see a brother, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin unto death. Now we know. We've already expounded on the fact that we cannot lose our salvation. But we can become so hardened and so stiff-necked we can go astray to the point. I heard a preacher describe it as like this before. That God says, well, you're really not profiting me anywhere here, so I'm going to take you on home. 
Hebrews 11, 26 says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins. Now our sins are forgiven. Which, sin, which of your sins are forgiven? All your sins. The scripture there is not teaching that we will have to pay for our own sins in eternity. Now we will lose reward, but it's not talking about perhaps purgatory or something that we will go through in eternity as a punishment. Those sins are paid for. If there is no more sacrifice from our sins and we're not going to pay for them in eternity, where do we pay for them? We pay for them here in the flesh. Jonah suffered an awful lot because of his stiff-neckedness, didn't he? Could you imagine how much easier Jonah's life would have been if he would have just followed God and wouldn't have uh, 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 bucked the system, wouldn't have kicked against the bricks? But people still today, maybe not to that extent, probably nobody here has been swallowed by a whale or a great fish. But at the same time, we suffer for our disobedience. And sometimes people get so hardened that God just goes ahead and takes them home. That's what John is talking about here. Now, years ago, we studied the 23rd Psalm, you might remember, in Sunday school. Um, a lot of years ago now, I think. And we used a book by a man named Philip Keller who was actually a shepherd. And he, he, he uh, commented on the 23rd Psalm and, and his experience as a shepherd. And he talked about a sheep that he had. And to this day, I mean, it's been years since I read this book, but I remember this part uh, pretty well. He had a sheep. Her name was, he called her Mrs. Gadabout. And she had an issue where she found a way that she could get out of his fence. And she was constantly going astray. And he would have to hunt her down or find her or do something to bring her back into the fold. And it was aggravating. But later on, as she continued to do it, she was teaching some of the younger lambs how to get out. They were following her. So for the good of the flock, he had Mr. and Mrs. Gadabout for dinner one night. He had to take her out of the flock because she was doing damage. She was leading them astray. I think of a deacon that I knew years ago, and I'm not going to presume, but, but it, to, the, the evidence is pretty good, that he threatened our pastor when I was a child. Wasn't happy with some, said, you won't be in that pulpit next Sunday. That deacon passed away during the week, had a heart attack and died. There is a sin unto death. We need to be careful. What we do, what we say, how we act, what our attitude is. He said, if you see someone going astray, pray for that brother. Because there is a sin unto death. And here's our contentment. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, once again, he is talking about someone who, who, who lives in sin. He's a, a, a Christian doesn't live in sin. Why? Because the, the Holy Spirit lives inside of him. The Holy Spirit inside of him testifies and, and, and groans. And many times, we, what, what we would perhaps many would call conscience is the, the Holy Spirit inside of us, keeping us from remaining in sin. 
causing us to repent, causing us to desire to return to the fellowship that we had with Christ. But the he that is begotten of himself, the wicked, uh, the wicked one toucheth not. But we know that we are of God, and the whole world is in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and that we are in him that is true, even as the Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and the eternal and eternal life. Our contentment in Christ is that God will keep us from sin. God will keep us. Uh, he, uh, Jesus had his disciples pray, lead us not into temptation. Will keep us from the wicked one. Keep us from the world. Our contentment is in Christ. Our desire is to fellowship with Christ. And he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. I don't think I need to comment on that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Would you all stand? Tonight, if you...